Welcome to the ninth and final lesson on situation ethics. And this is where we're focusing on how compatible is situation ethics with other Christian approaches to moral decision making. Now the first thing that we can say is that Christianity is an incredibly varied religion. It has over two billion followers on virtually every continent. And as you can see on the screen in front of you, there are various ways of expressing the Christian faith. So there's going to be a plurality, a multiplicity of Christian viewpoints. And the answer to this question is going to be, understandably, quite complex. One thing I'd like to draw your attention to is the difference between the church in the bottom right of the screen and the church in the top left. The top left is an orthodox church and you can see it's so complex, the architecture is intricate and ornate and it's a beautiful, heavenly looking building. In the bottom right you have a container uh, that's usually part of a truck, towed on a truck and it's been turned into a trucker's chapel. What I like about the contrast between these two images is that the people who go to church in Moscow probably would look on the one in Horizon City with a little bit of disdain. They probably don't see that box as a proper church. They probably see it as not quite the right thing to do. And they probably wouldn't go to it. Similarly, though, the the member of the the members of the Truckers Chapel in Horizon City probably view Saint Basil's in Moscow with disdain. It's so beautiful and ornate, but is that really the purpose of religion? Christianity is complex, varied, with many different manifestations, and so we should expect a similar level of complexity in Christian approaches to moral decision making, just as we see this variety in their approach to liturgy and worship. Now, in Christian ethics, there are a variety of sources of moral authority, and some Christians value some more than others. Everyone accepts that the life and example of Jesus Christ is sacrosanct and the most important aspect within Christianity. Following on from that, there is a veneration of the Bible as containing divinely inspired guidance. The Quakers are less committed to the exact words of the Bible than, say, the Catholics or the Anglicans or Protestant evangelical Christians, but they still venerate the text. Thirdly, prayer plays a, plays a hugely important role um, when a Christian is trying to work out what to do in any given moral situation. They will seek guidance from the Holy Spirit and advice from their church tradition in big councils or synods, like this one in the penultimate picture, or, in the case of Catholics, from a person they believe is invested in in an authority that comes from Jesus himself. So this is the figure of the Pope, who um, is the Bishop of Rome, the father of the church, and has the Petrine ministry, follows in the footsteps of Peter, and has the keys that determine what's loosened on earth and what's loosened in heaven. So here is a variety of Christian moral um, sources, and they will use a combination of these to decide the correct course in ethical decision making. For our purposes, because one of the key things about situation ethics is its breaking of rules, its anti-legalism, and its focus on one guiding principle only, the middle way of situation ethics, we're going to focus on different Christian reactions to rules. So we can see in the New Testament that the idea of God being a lawgiver, someone who sets the moral framework for the entire universe, is fundamentally important. Um, in the epistle of James, it says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy. But you, who are you to judge your neighbour? 
And this is a fantastic quote, really, for, um, for let's say, a Catholic to criticize situation ethics. Clearly for James, the idea of God is predicated on the notion that there are a web of moral rules that wrap around the world and that God decided them. Now, if we reject that belief, like situation ethics does and focuses on relativism instead, we lose a key aspect of God's identity. He stops being the universal lawgiver and is instead just merely a guide in a relativistic world of um, shifting moral allegiances which lack any moral structure or laws. And this seems to contradict what Jesus himself says when he says, I did not come to abolish the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And you can see in the figure of the Ten Commandments that this seems to be the fundamental approach to Christian decision making. God is the lawgiver, there are rules, and they are there to be followed. Having said that, the person of Jesus is someone who challenges conventional morality and who has no time or respect for the strict legalism of the Pharisees. When Jesus is asked to take part in the stoning of an adulteress, he is given the honorary position of being the person who's allowed to throw the first stone, but he recognises this as the trap that it was, and instead he offers this honorary position to anyone who is without sin. Because there is no one in the group without sin, they can't throw the stone to begin the stoning of the adulteress, and so she is let go. Um, Jesus admonishes her and tells her not to behave like this in the future. But it's, the, it's important for us to notice that the correct punishment, which is the killing by stoning of the adulteress, was forsaken. He mercifully forgave her. And so Jesus seems to have taken um, a relativistic, personalistic approach to this ethical dilemma. When he was criticised for breaking strict rules, Jesus reminded the Pharisees that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Here he's saying that the rules that we follow as religious people were made for us, to make us better, rather than we were made to follow these religious rules. And that is a crucial distinction, well worth bringing to the examiner's attention. Joseph Fletcher continues this idea then and says, based on his reading of the New Testament, that Jesus rejects strict moral laws in favour of relativistic, pragmatic, personalistic approach to ethics. And again, there is evidence. There is the fundamental golden rule in Christian decision-making um, that goes alongside loving God. We are expected to love our neighbour and love God. And Jesus seems to have summed up the law in this way. The Catholic Church, however, would respond by saying, no, the Ten Commandments are still there. They aren't suggestions or recommendations. They are things that must be followed. The Catechism, which is the book of ethical teachings that contains the moral laws and guidance that Catholics should follow and adhere to, states very clearly that it must be recognised that a good intention cannot make a bad action good. The end does not justify the means. So the laws aren't there simply to bring about a positive result, and we can skip the laws in order to get the positive result, or we can even break the laws in order to get the positive result. No, the laws are something that need to be followed in and of themselves. They are part of God's moral laws. They are part of the framework and structure of the world that he has put in place as the omnipotent and omniscient lawgiver. Cardinal Newman, who was a leading member of the Church of England, who swapped over and converted and became a Catholic, very famous person in British society in the Victorian period, stated, 
It were better for sun and moon to drop from heaven, for the earth to fail, and for all the many millions who are upon it to die of starvation, in extremest agony, so far as temporal affliction goes, than that one soul, I will not say should be lost, but should commit one single venial sin, should tell one willful untruth, though it harmed no one. So here, you've got the Catholic approach being that the laws must be followed, even if the consequences are benign, if they're broken, the laws are so crucial they must always be followed. And this puts it fundamentally at odds with situation ethics and a situation ethicist approach to moral decision making. The two are fundamentally opposed. I talked about Thomas Aquinas in a previous video and you can go back and watch that at this point to, to illustrate this further. But the Catholic view is that God has made the world, he's made it with moral laws, we have reason, we can discern those moral laws and we must follow them. A situation ethicist view is that Jesus got rid of such things, that man has come of age, and we can all decide there and then, in the moment, what the moral thing to do is. These positions are incompatible with each other. And it's fascinating. They start from the same principles of Christianity, but they end up in radically opposed directions. Deontology to consequentialism and relativism to absolutism. They are fundamentally opposed. That being said, there are some other Christian churches that follow a set of decision-making principles that are very similar to situation ethics. Now, the Catholic Church is enormous. It has over a billion followers. Uh, over half of all Christians are Catholic. And Quakerism is comparatively absolutely tiny, with perhaps a quarter of a million followers worldwide, about 20,000 in the UK. This is a small religion, or small branch of Christianity, I should say. But Quakerism says, along with situation ethics, that we should be guided by agape, and by doing the most loving thing, and that being rule-bound and just following laws and legalism is never going to be an appropriate or a successful way of living a truly Christian life. They believe that the example of Jesus um, teaches them to break laws or to reject legalism in order to do the most loving thing. And so they are very compatible with Joseph Fletcher's situation ethics. So, to conclude, on the one side... Um, Jesus himself seems to claim that um, strict rules should be rejected. And that means if you're agreeing with Jesus, you should be agreeing with Christian ethics. Jesus again summarised the commandments as being all about love. And modern Quaker ethics recognise this. So on the one hand, we've got three reasons why situation ethics are compatible with um, Christian approaches to ethical decision making. On the other hand, if God is the universal lawgiver, there should be universal laws. The starting point of situation ethics is that it's relativist and it says that there aren't universal moral laws. And therefore, a key aspect of the Christian concept of God is torn up and thrown away when a Christian embarks on a, upon a situation ethics approach to moral decision making. It would seem to degrade the role of the Ten Commandments, which are obviously meant to be universal rules. Jesus himself claimed that he didn't want to abolish the laws, but to fulfil them. And in Catholic ethics, which is built on this idea that we can understand moral laws around us, the ends do not justify the means. We cannot do bad things in order to achieve good results. And again, that's a, a fundamental point of situation ethics. And finally, both Catholics and Anglicans would agree that sometimes there are clear moral lines in the sand that simply cannot be crossed. And this is not a view situation ethics shares, and so the two approaches are fundamentally incompatible. It's up to you to decide which side of this argument is most convincing.